How you doing? Now I'm back again, and it's time to learn about concurrency in Go. Um, I'm going to assume you already have the basic knowledge of how to do like Go syntax and how to use things like variables and loops and slices and blah 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 blah. Um, so <laughs> you see, I have some code written out here in front of you. Um, and what this is doing is it's um it's basically attempting to simulate that you're processing a bunch of something. Um, you'll see I have a for loop here in this function called process um, that I'm passing in some 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 string of some things we're processing, <laughs> and we have this for loop that, as you can tell, just doesn't ever stop. And I have this sleep here to simulate that there's some processing time needed for this item, and then it um prints out to the console what the actual like what the pro that it finished processing this thing. Um, so if we if we come down here and we run this, you'll see process one, order two, three, four, five, and it'll go on and on until I stop. Um, now this is fine, but what if you um what if you have to process something else too? Um, we're processing orders. Maybe we have to process refunds because people bought your shit and they weren't happy with it, so they want they want their money back. So we're gonna have another call to process here, and we're gonna re process a uh, refund. So we're gonna run this. But um, oopsie daisy, this is never ever going to get to refund because it's too busy processing orders. Hmm, this is a problem. How do we solve this problem? Well, ideally, maybe we can run these things concurrently, you know, kind of at the same time if possible. Well, you can do that in Go. Uh, you can do that using, <laughs> excuse me, using something called a Go routine. A Go routine takes a function that's like a block of code that's been uh, invoked and sort of just throws it into the background where the go runtime works with the system in order to run it um, whenever it can on, on whatever hardware is available. And to make this run in a go routine, all you gotta do is slap the go keyword in front of it. That's it, that's all you gotta do. So now what'll happen is it'll send this process into the background to process orders, while starting up the process to process refunds, so people get their money back and quit bitching. Um, so we're gonna run this, and you see it's it's running everything fine. Cool, cool beans. Um, in fact, you know what? Um, why not just throw this in the go routine too? I mean, that makes sense to me. You know, we we may need to process other things in the future. Might as well just go ahead and throw this in the go routine too, go routine too right? Oops, didn't do anything. Why is that? So, oops, I'm on the wrong screen. If if you throw this in a Go routine too, keep in mind that when you throw these in the Go routines, these are no longer blocking calls. It'll send it in the background and then move along. But after it moves along from this one, oops, the main routine's done. So it just exits and then just cleans up all the other routines without them actually having time to do anything. So how do we solve this problem? Well, um, there's a couple ways. Uh, a sort of janky way to do it that I've heard people do but I've never actually seen it myself is you could stick something here that makes it wait like forces the program to wait until you tell it to stop um, one of the ways you can do that is um, there is a function in the FMT uh, package called uh, scan line uh, basically what this is it's it's going to sit there and wait for user input so <laughs> it's basically going to sit there and keep process processing things until you um, hit basically any key. So it's gonna keep running, it's gonna keep running, and then maybe I'm tired of doing it, and I just hit enter, and it's done, okay? Uh, but like I said, this is kind of a, a janky way to do it. There's, there's probably like a more, mm, more uniform way to do it, and there is. So I'm gonna get rid of this, and I'm gonna get rid of one of, the <laughs> one of these to show you how to do this. So there's a, a sync package that's used to kind of help synchronize uh, processes that are running in, uh, concurrently. And uh, I'm going to use something called a wait group. So we're going to do um, var, I'm just going to call it wg, we do sync.wait group. That's it, that's it. That's it. Yeah. So um, what is a wait group? Uh, actually, all this really is is like a counter. And um, when you want to tell it how many processes it has to wait, for in order to be to like how many processes it's waiting on. All you do is you do wait group dot add, I believe, and like one. Um, this is saying, hey, 
there's there's going to be there's one process that's running that you have to wait on um, and then the way and then uh, we go down here at the bottom and you're going to do done so what done's going to do is going to block and it's going to sit here until this wait group counter reaches zero so we're we're we we're, we're adding this and we're waiting on it, but we're not actually decrementing it. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take this away, and I'm gonna wrap this in an anonymous go function like this, and over there, over there, and evoke it, and we're gonna put this in here, move it over, and. So um, if you haven't seen anonymous functions in Go, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is basically <laughs> like a it's like a, a light, like a lambda in like JavaScript or something like that. You're basically just creating this nameless function and then immediately evoking it. Um, and since you have the Go keyword in front of this, this will be sent in the background to you know do its thing. So <laughs> we want these this process to uh, continue. And this time we're not going to have it be done infinitely. We're going to have it like stop and say like I is less than or equal to <laughs> five. Yeah. So that way it'll only do it like five times. So what we want to happen is after this is done, we want to tell the wait group that's done. And we do that by, I believe it's uh, wait group dot. Oh, wait, is, this is done. I'm, I'm a boo boo. This is, this is wait. Or, yeah. Brain, please work. Okay, that's how it works. So what's going to happen now is it's going to create this wait group, tell it that it's going to be waiting on that's waiting on one thing, uh, send this process into the background, and then when this process is done, it's going to tell the wait group, okay, I'm done. And in the meantime, it's going to wait until it's that the uh, this little counter here goes down to zero. So if we run this, it'll run, and we'll get to five, and okay, it's done. Um, now, this is fine and dandy, but I don't think the function that's doing the processing should necessarily be actually also responsible for like printing out this this you know this message that it's done. Ideally, you'd want to give this processed uh, item back to the main routine so they could do something with it. So how do so we basically want to communicate with the Go routine running in the background? How do we do that? Well, this is where you make use of what Go a thing in Go has called channels. So I'm going to um, <coughs> excuse me. I'm going to get rid of all of this and all all of this and move this back over. Okay. Uh, so I want to keep this the same. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to add an extra argument here, and I'm just going to call it out. And we're making it, and we're gonna say it's a channel. And when you're passing in uh, a channel, you have to tell it uh, what it's um, what it's done, like uh, what what data type it is. It's passing around in the channel. So I'm just gonna say it's a string because we're basically just passing back, or not string. Uh, yeah, we'll just say string. We're passing back. We'll just say we'll just say we're passing back this this message as I sound. Um, so we need to actually make the channel. Uh, you do that with uh, we're gonna just call it. Um, out one and use the make function channel string and we're going to pass this into this now that we're passing a channel into this function i don't really want this to be printing out to the console anymore um, instead i basically i want to pass the processed item back out to the main routine so that they can do whatever it wants to do with it. um and to do that what we're going to do is uh we reference the variable like this and we use this little arrow syntax, and we're gonna pass the item, not, not time, you forget this tie item there. Thank you. Um, so there's this, if you see, what you see this little arrow syntax, um, if you see it pointing towards a variable that's a channel, you're putting data into it. Um, and as you might guess, if you see it on the other side, like this, uh, uh, like that. <laughs> what you're doing is reading data back out of the channel. And we gotta make sure this is running in the Go routine. And we'll do FMT print line. I'm just gonna print the the thing that was processed. And now if we run this, it should so it only printed out one order, which makes sense. We only we're only reading out of the channel once. Um 
but we we want to keep reading out of the channel so i i guess let's let's just wrap this in a for loop how's that sound and we'll remove this in here make this not look like crap and then we're going to run this again so it should keep printing out order order to five oopsie daisy we had a deadlock what why why is it that why did it deadlock so when you um read data out of a channel or try to put data into a channel by when you just make channels like this this is a <laughs> this is what's called a blocking this is a blocking call actually whenever you try to put data into a channel it will block until there's something ready to receive it on the other side and also in in reverse if a if a um if a routine has indicated that it's waiting for data from a channel this will block until it actually gets something from the channel when this is finished um this is done but <laughs> this is still sitting here going i'm still waiting on data and so it just sits there forever and the runtime can figure out that uh we're we're just sitting here nothing nothing's going to happen this is basically stuck so how do you solve this problem uh, so you can actually uh, manually close channels with the close function if you are done with them. So now, and in order to check this, when you actually pull data out of a channel like this, you actually get a second variable, a Boolean, that indicates whether the channel is still, uh, I think it's still open. And uh, usually you'll see it called like okay, but I tend to call it like open whenever you see this used. And then <laughs> you can reference this like if, if not, if not open, then that's brain. Uh, then then break break out of this loop so that way it's not deadlocked waiting for messages that aren't going to come anymore so it runs five and it's done yay um there's actually a much easier way to do basically this whole thing where you're <coughs> reading data out of a channel until it's done and uh that's so instead of doing this we're going to say uh message equals and you know like that that nice little range keyword that works on the slices and stuff it actually works on channels too um uh, what this is going to do is continuously read data out of this channel into this variable until it's closed and then it'll just automatically break out the forward so we can just literally get rid of everything there except for this and <coughs> run this and it should do the exact same thing wow look at that one thing to keep in mind when closing channels is you should never close a channel from the receiving end and the reason why is if you close out a channel before another while another go routine is still trying to like send data into the channel if you send data into a closed channel the runtime will panic and crash uh, so if you are if you're wanting to manually close out channels when you're done with them never do it from the receiving end always do it from the sending end also when you're closing out channels there's actually a neat little keyword you can use in go to make sure that this actually gets closed out properly um it's called the defer keyword the defer keyword if you uh whatever you put after it uh when this current scope is done so in the case of this where i'm putting this um, when this function is done it will execute that code so if you know that you're going to have to close this channel when you're done another way to do this is to do defer close out so what this will do is when this block of code is done when this when this entire function is done this for loop is done this fact and this function exits it will actually execute <coughs> excuse me this code to close this channel so if I run this, as you see, it goes three, four, five, as done. So defer is really actually really useful for making sure that if you if you are like putting stuff into like a go routine that needs cleaned up, to like you put it at the start to remind yourself that these all need to be done. Now originally the whole thing we were trying to do is to both have orders and refunds be processed concurrently. Um, and then have the item returned to me to uh, you know do something with it in the main routine. Um, so you see, I've kind of replicated that again here, but within in, within anonymous functions because I've done something a little different. Um, I've made the discovery that hmm, orders and refunds <coughs> don't take the same amount of time to get processed. 
uh, it seems that refunds take twice as long to get processed as, re as, as the actual orders. Hmm. I wonder if this might cause a problem. You see down here, we just have a, a for loop that's running forever. That's uh, just printing out the, the output of these, um, the order and refunds being processed. So if we, uh, <laughs> excuse me, if we run this, what you, theoretically what you should see is for every one time you see a refund process, you should see two orders process, right? So if we run this, hmm, you, we seem to hit a bottleneck. What is the bottleneck? Well, if you recall, um, this will block until it has data. <laughs> and because the refunds take longer to uh, process than the orders, this is basically setting here when this, even when this has data. So how do we uh, get this, like choose wh whichever one we want to do? Well, we can do this by making use of this thing called a select statement. It's uh, very similar to a case statement, but it's, it's unique to uh, channels. And the way it works is, so we're going to have select, okay, like this, and we're going to have a case uh, message equals out of out one, like this. Uh, we're going to fmt dot print line message. Uh, else we're going to have case message equals pulling out of out two, fmt dot print line message, yeah, like that. And we're we'll get rid of these. So what should happen here is is when channel one or when this first channel has data ready, it'll pull it out. Um, when channel two has data ready, it'll pull it out. Uh, but since this one's slower, instead of constantly waiting, it'll just recheck this one. That way, it, there's no there's not really any like downtime. So if we run this now, you'll see you'll see order process twice for every time you see a refund process. There you go. Um, so now you should be able to create good routines, <laughs> um, pa uh, create channels, pass channels to those good routines, and pass data back and forth, close the channels, and read out, read selectively out of more than one channel with a select statement. That's all I got for y'all today. Uh, if this video helped you out in any way, shape, or form, uh, be sure to share it to someone else if you think that they'll be able to help them out as well. And with that, y'all come on back now and I'll see y'all next time.